two, three, go. Dear Carlos, Professor Nelson, we start now. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the virtual channel of the graduate program in food science at the College of Pharmacy of the Federal University of Bahia. Today, November 8, we will be meeting. Uh, by video conference to honor the lecture Insect and Meat Crop Products as Novel in Imaging Protein Search, Extraction Techniques and Process. Will be given by researcher Carlos Alvarez Garcia at the invitation of Professor Nelson Colau, course coordinator of Topics in Food Science at the Graduate Program in Food Science. And Therefore, you will lead this event. In this sense, I would like to greet and thank Sir Carlos Alvarez Garcia again for having accepted the invitation of the Professor Nelson for this conference. In addition, thank you also to those who are following us for the live broadcast on the YouTube channel. Professor, Professor Nelson, please. Feel free. Thank you, Professor Adelan Ferreira and uh, Professor Carolina de Souza also. Uh, hello, everybody. Here we are at the Federal University of Bahia graduate program in food science in the course Topics in Food Science. I'm Professor Nelson Colauto, responsible for this course. And this is part of the internationalization initiative of the graduate program in food science. Today, you have the pleasure to welcome the research officer, Dr. Carlos Alvarez Garcia from TGAST, Dublin, Ireland. Um, TGAST is equivalent to Embrapa in Brazil. Carlos Alvarez is a biologist with a master in science, PhD, and postdoctoral degree in food biotechnology. Today's topic is going to be insects and meat products as novel and emerging protein sources, extraction techniques, and processing. Um, thank you, Professor Carlos, uh, Dr. Carlos, for your presentation, and uh, the word is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Nelson and Ederlan, for the introduction and for the presentation. So I'm very happy to be here. I am very honored to be invited for this conference. Uh, yeah, the conference will be in English as a, as advice. I might use some Spanish words if I got as struggling with the English word, but I, I'll try to be consistent with the language. Um, so just yes, a little bit about me, as Nelson said, I have a PhD in food biotechnology and the main topics of my research is meat quality and meat products, but I also focus a lot on how to make the meat industry more sustainable and also looking for emerging protein sources. So you might be aware that beef production or livestock in general uh, is uh, is not considered to be very sustainable. It might have a big impact on the environment. So we're trying to minimize this impact in the environment and also looking for another ways to produce the proteins we need to feed the population. But these ways, what we are looking to, they need to be more sustainable or more friendly with the environment. So I, I will divide my presentation in, the, in these two different topics. The first one will be insects, uh, which is a, a it's kind of a novel food for Europe. Uh, so I will explain why it's novel for us and what type of legislation and what type of processing and what type of research we're doing with insects. And then I will move on in the second part to the meat products and I will explain one of the biggest projects that we have in Ireland and what type of research and the main result that we got in this project. So 
that will be that's the overview of the presentation and i will share my screen now so you will be able to see my my slides let me know if you can see them properly please yes it's fine okay very good so yeah so the first question is uh, why insects why we're interested in insects as a protein or a a source of protein, an alternative protein. So the most important factor for us is the sustainability or how they, they are better for the environment when we compare to another type of livestock. So they have a higher feed conversion efficiency. It means that you need less feed to get the same amount of protein to be used in food products or to be used for feed the population. The CO2 equivalent is much lower. So by producing the same amount of uh, biomass, the release of CO2 is much lower. And also because the livestock usually is a surface growth, you need a lot of land, you need a lot of surface to make this. But with insects, it's totally different. You can have this uh, growing in horizontal trays or platforms, so the land use is much less. And also the water you need is much lower as well. So that's the main reasons why we have this interest in insects. So uh, they are more sustainable, they need less resources, and still you can get the same amount of protein. Something we're looking at also is the economics of insects. So it's not that easy to replace beef with insects. We have to look for the economic of this. You have to look at the, pro the, the business or the production is profitable as well for the producer and for the manufacturers. But the, the actual forecast is saying that insect production is a growing market, uh, even more specifically in the United States of America and in Europe. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's forecast that will grow a lot over the next few, uh, next few years. In Europe, we have uh, still some legal barriers on how to use insects for food. Uh, but we hope that these legal barriers will be removed over the next few years. So with this easy uh, legal frame, uh, we hope that the insect market will grow a lot. So we are doing now the research that will be needed in the future for the producers and for the consumers. So once the legal frame allow us to put insects into the market, we will have the knowledge we need to answer the consumer questions about safety, about nutrition, or about how freely, environmental friendly is this production compared with traditional ones. Uh, I mentioned before that insects, the main uh, nutrient that we can get from them is protein. So usually after drying the insect, you can get about 50, 70% protein content, which is a very remarkable amount of proteins uh, and can be compared with dry meat or dry eggs, for example, or even with dairy powders. Uh, all the essential amino acids are present in the insects, so they can be considered as a, a high nutritive value protein source. And also, all the amino acids are in a balanced um, proportion. So you don't need to complement this protein with an extra protein, uh, like it might happen with the plant-based proteins that you need to combine some of them to provide all the essential amino acids you need in the diet. I'm making emphasis in these three species here, which is the mealworms, cricket, and locust, because these are the only three insect species that are allowed to be consumed in Europe at the moment. And this is only in a few countries, as, we, as I will explain a little bit later on. So I mentioned before that the regulatory framework in Europe is very strict with insects because they are considered novel food. It means that um, these uh, insects were not consumed extensively in Europe before 1997. So any product, any food, or any new formulation that has not been consumed until 1997 for a large extent of the population, it's considered a novel food. And therefore, you have to apply for a novel food application to the European Union. And 
it takes a few years for them to approve because they need to ensure that the new food is safe. It's no risk. There is no allergens in there. There is no accumulation of heavy metals that the microbial stability is granted. So all these type of things that you have to certify when putting a food product into the market. So as I mentioned before, only the locusts, crickets, and mealworms are approved currently in Europe. And the map is a little bit uh, small, but only these countries in green uh, are the ones approving insects for consumption. The other countries in Europe, or they are in a, a stage transfer. It means that they are looking at the legislation at the moment. So probably in a few months or in a couple of years, they will approve the consumption of insects. And the ones in red, uh, they are not even looking at the legislation uh, or they are not uh, have any plan to prove insects so far. Where I'm based in Ireland is one of these red countries. So insects are not approved at the moment in our country, but it's still we are allowed to do the research. So as I mentioned before, once the legislation is more favorable for the insects, we will have the knowledge, we will have the expertise to help any company or to help um, any producer to put insects in the market. In any case, there are some reports, some papers that are published by EFSA. EFSA is the European Food Safety Authority. And these are the ones that makes the recommendation about when a novel food is ready to be commercialized. So in the last couple of years, there have been reports about mealworms and crickets that if you follow a particular way of processing and you market them in a particular format, they can be commercialized. But this recommendation needs to be adopted by each of the countries in the European Union. Uh, we know that in other countries and other parts of the world, this is not the case. For instance, in South uh, East Asia, uh, or in Africa or even Mexico. I'm not very sure about South America, to be honest, what's the current situation. But in all these, all the parts of the world, insects are part of traditional diets. So they are very familiar with them. They know how to cook them. They know how to process them. But the vast majority of these insects are harvested from, from the nature, for the wild. They are not coming from farms. And that's not legal or won't be legal in Europe. Everything needs to be coming from a food grade facilities where the insects are farmed following certain specifications and certain conditions. So for example, in five years ago, sorry, seven years ago, uh, mealworms, which is one of the accepted species, was, uh, ad, was uh, approved and was said that it's to be safe but only if it's dried um, and marketed in a powder form. So it's very restrictive at the moment. So in order for us to answer all these questions, if an insect is safe, if how nutritive is the insects or uh, how this can be processed to keep the nutritional value of the insects, I'm collaborating with this uh, European project. Um, I will do a little bit of publicity here, sorry, uh, but... Um, this, by this project, it's, uh, it, it's participated by several countries. So it's Ireland, and UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Switzerland. So the main ob objectives of our, uh, of our project is just how to, how to use food co-products as substrates, which means that, um, as you know, one of the main concerns or the main challenge for the food industry is the high amount of food waste generated or food co-products that not use it anymore. So they are just maybe used for as fertilizer or they're just composted, but they don't have a further use in the food chain. So part of our investigation is, okay, let's recover all this food waste. Let's recover all these food co-products. Let's characterize them. And then we will use this to feed the insects. And let's see how the insects, after being reared or produced using these substrates, how nutritive they are and how safe they are. So that's one of the main objectives of our, of our project. So we will determine the impact of the substrates and processing practices 
on the nutritional and also on the functional properties of the final products. As you might know, when you are um, incorporating a protein rich uh, ingredient in a new product, you need to know the emulsifying capacity, the solubility, the gelling ability. So we are evaluating all these properties in the in the protein in the inset products that we generate to be sure that they can be incorporated in different products. Uh, also, depending on the solubility, the emulsion, or the foaming capacity, we we can advise in which type of final products they can be incorporated. So it could be like a meat emulsion, like a sausage. It could be a, a drink, like a milkshake uh, with uh, improved uh, protein content, or it could be like a protein bar or a snack, depending on these uh, properties. The other thing that we are doing as well, that we are very concerned about the safety of these products. So we selected different products already in the market from those countries allowing the insects uh, to be commercialized. And we are looking at the shelf life just to ensure that there is no any pathogen, there is no any bacteria that it's particular of the insects that can be a hazard or can be a risk for the human health. So that's part of our study as well. And finally, uh, the main barrier after the legislation in Europe is that the consumers, they don't accept insects. So we are doing a type of education, we're doing a type of uh, promotion of insects. So we're trying to understand why the consumers in Europe, they don't want to try insects. What are the things that they feel that they are not liking from insects and we're trying to overcome these challenges. That's the, the final part of our, of our project. So just to put a little bit of details, um, we did um, one of the trials we did. We, uh, we identified several food co-products of our interest that to be used to feed the insects. So as I will explain later in the second part of the presentation, I'm very focused on meat co-products, okay? And one of the main meat co-products that I'm more interested in is blood. The blood collected from pork, blood collected from beef, or even from sheep. And I'm using or I'm looking for new uses for this, uh, for this blood uh, co-product. So we decide to use proteins from blood that they have no another use at the moment or they have very little use. We decide to use this blood to feed the insects and see how increasing the protein content in the feed from these uh, blood proteins, how this might impact the final nutritional value of the insects. So what you can see here in this table is the different feeding substrates that we use. Uh, they were formulated using increasing concentration of red cells. And as you can see, the protein content of the formulations varied from 16%, that, that's the control diet, up to 40%, which was the diet with the highest protein content. So we fed the insects with this diet, uh, and then we harvest the insects after a couple of months of them growing on this uh, on this diet. And what we saw is that as the protein content was increasing in the diet, the final protein content in the insect decreases a little bit. But most interested is that we could see that the fat content in the final product, in the final insect, increased almost twice, was double, double than the control diet. It means that we were able to manipulate the protein and the fat profile of the insect just by changing their diet. That's very important because by doing this, we can optimize the growing process of the insects and say we are more interested on protein, we are more interested on fat, and just modify the, the breeding uh, operations depending on your final objective. Something that we're looking at at the moment is to see if the, as you know, hemoglobin, the red cells, is an excellent source of iron, which is a, a nutrient that uh, the most of the people it's lacking. It's uh, it's like it's not considered a pandemic, but it's a, I think it's affecting around two, three billion people around the world. 
So what we are now looking at is if the insects are able to accumulate iron on their bodies because they are being fed with a rich iron source. And hopefully if this works, we will see that the insects can be used as a vehicle for iron to be used uh, to, to fortify the diets of the people eating proteins from insects. We don't have the results as yet, but hopefully in a couple of months we will be able to answer this question. So that was very briefly about the insects because this is something that it's starting now in Europe. There is, we have more questions than, than answers, to be honest. Uh, but just keep in mind that the inserts are growing. It's a growing market in, um, in our region and uh, it's deemed to be more sustainable. So we're proposing to the farmers, we're proposing to the current livestock producers to combine their production with insect production. The legislative framework is getting more favorable, but it's very slow at the moment. But we hope that in a few years, uh, insect will be approved in Europe. So that will trigger, that will be like a catalyzer for, for the future of this, uh, of this market. So as I mentioned, many questions need to be answered. And then we, but the project I'm involved, we're trying to answer these questions. So for instance, we did a survey about, we, we, we did questions to about 1000 people around Europe. And the most of them, they said that they will never try an insect if you present the whole insect to them. But we say, okay, what happens if we make a powder out of the insect, we incorporate this protein into a, into a food that you already know, it could be a burger, it could be a sausage. So then the acceptance increased a lot. So we're trying to explore this, uh, this, av these avenues to see how we can incorporate these proteins and how this could be uh, accepted by, by the European consumers. Something that we saw as well, that the age is very relevant. So the most of the people older than 40 years, they will never try insects. But the students, teenagers, or people among 20, 30 years old, that they are much more aware about the climate change problem, about the environmental issues, they will be very happy to incorporate insects into their diets as long as they are safe and tasty. So this is more or less the, the current situation in, in, in Europe about insect consumption. So that will finish the first half of the, of the presentation of the, this seminar. So I think it's uh, before moving to the next one, that could be a good time for having any discussion or any question around that. I'll try to answer it to the best of my knowledge. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will try to find something for you so I can contact Nelson in the coming days and, uh, and provide the answer. Right, thank you. Uh, if somebody has a question, there is a second part of the presentation. Uh, but he's open for questions now. Uh, pessoal, tem, ele está aberto a perguntas, né? pode fazer algumas perguntas, não precisam fazer todas, e depois ele vai continuar com a outra parte da apresentação. Mas se alguém quiser fazer uma pergunta nesse momento, é o um momento. Por favor. Luciana, it's your question. Go on. Ok. okay. Uh, it's more like a curiosity, not really a question. I was wondering when you were talking about the use of blood as a source of food for insects, I was mm -hmm. wondering like the logistics of it and also like how is this blood going to um, arrive to those insects like a, like a powder or the real blood, like bloody liquid? Okay. No, um, the, the current situation on blood is that every single liter produced in Europe needs to be collected. So there are companies specialized in collecting the blood in uh, an hygienic, uh, I mean, uh, hygienica, uh, okay? So it's clean and it's safe to be eaten, or at least that's the, the, the legislation. So these companies, they bring all this blood to their facilities and they do a first step of centrifugation so they get the plasma and the red cells. They got the two different fractions from the blood, okay? The plasma has many uses. It's tasteless, it's rich in protein, and it's very good with uh, 
functional properties. So it has a market for that. For the red cells, there is not such a market because it's uh, very bitter, very metallic taste, and also it's a pro-oxidant. So if you incorporate this into any product, the oxidation will be much faster, and that's just something not desirable. So what they do is they use a spray dryer. They have massive spray dryers, and you get a powder out of it. This powder then can be transported to the reading facilities, and this powder is blended or mixed with another ingredients that are fed to the insects. That's the, that's the process. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, no more hands raised. I, I have I have a curiosity, Carlos. Yeah. Uh, um, um, uh, when the, you've told you are using blood to, to as a substrate to grow insects, it reminds me uh, at the beginning uh, in England uh, when. The, uh, they have problems with uh, the crazy cow disease uh, because of prions. And today we have problems with the uh, virus uh, mm -hmm. and even bacteria. And uh, uh, this is quite usual in England, in all the region uh, there in Great Britain, uh, to, to uh, use uh, that uh, kind of a residue to feed other animals. Mm -hmm. Is this too not a problem? Because I think uh, it's very controversial, uh, at least. <laughs> yeah, at the moment, we can only use pork blood, only pork blood. That's the one that that's approved for this type of practices. Uh, bovine blood needs to be incinerated and it needs to be discarded or cannot be used to feed animals. So it can be used for fertilizer, can be used for composting or to generate biogas but it cannot be back to the food chain at the moment, at the moment. Um, and then, sorry, uh, yeah, that, that's the problem with the, with, the, with the cow's blood. So we are still support, but what we are doing, what we're seeing is that um, the nutritional profile, the amino acid profile of the red cells from blood, from cattle or from pork is practically the same. So, if eventually this is allowed to use again, we won't see any difference. So both sources will be equally well or equally uh, satisfactory when, when, when used for animal feed as well. I didn't mention that in the presentation, but there is a fourth animal insect species that can be used, which is a black soldier fly. Uh, but this can only be used for animal feed. It's not approved for human food. So that's another way that uh, that you can reuse a lot of the manure, a lot of the waste generated in farms. The black shorter fly can eat almost any type of organic material. So they are very used to recirculate, are very used to uh, recycle a lot of different uh, products coming from the farm operations. Uh, we did some studies with them, with the black soldier fly, uh, and we saw that uh, you can feed them with manure. Horse and chicken seems to be the best one for them. Uh, daily manure is not as good, but it's still okay. And what you see is that they grow very well. You can harvest the black soldier flies, and they are a very nice source of protein. But whatever is left, which is the manure together with the um, feces of the insect, is even a richer source of nitrogen and nutrients for the plants. So this is like a win-win situation. You recover as many products you can in the form of um, insect protein, and then whatever is left is even more nutritious to, to fertilize the plants. Right, thank you. Um... Uh, another curiosity, uh, is that any concerns about uh, uh, that blood and uh, the blood they is taken in, in the farm or in the place where they are slaughtered or it's an uh, industrial system that is transported? How, how could you explain oh, no. a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, here is an industrial system. So, for instance, in Ireland, there is just one single company collecting all the blood that is generated in the country. 
and then they centralize all this blood in a single facility as it's a small factory but they process all the blood of the country and out of that they do the plasma in form of a fry sorry spray dried plasma and the red cells in order to avoid any concern on any risk with bacteria viruses and things like that uh, every single kilo of powder they produce they need to store that for at least one month and after one month they do a microbial analysis and if the microbial analysis is okay they release the product but they always have to wait one month before releasing the product um, something uh, we, we tried as well other uh, other co-products or other waste so we use like um, non i mean ex expired vegetables or fruits we use as well chicken feathers we use as well uh, roots and even catering waste and all of them in a, when you combine them in a specific combination of uh, to reach a minimum protein and uh, carbohydrates content the insects can grow on that the, the the thing is that there is very little know about the, the dietary requirements of insects so it's trial and error yes uh, you do trials with the diets to see which one performs better but uh, at the moment we don't know if there is any um, limiting amino acid if is there any mineral they it's essential for them uh, we know something about the vitamins but not all of them are essential to the insects and also the amino acids we know the most of them which one are essential or not but still there are some information missed there so it's more like trying an error at the moment right thank you carlos if anybody else has a question or if not we can move on okay okay i think we can move on go on carlos okay so the, the second half of the presentation it's very related to the previous one so this is how to look for uh, opportunities and um, a, a better use of the meat cup products so well that's the, the few points i will cover but um, the current situation of the meat cup products is more or less like that depending if it comes from cattle pork or even ships around 40 50 percent of the live animal weight is not meat it's, con it's something else could be the blood could be the bones skin internal organs and things like that that they have a, the most of them they have a very low value in the market or even the processor they have to pay to get them disposal so it's an extra cost for the processor uh, some of them might have little use as i explain later on but uh, in our country we are one of the biggest beef producers in europe even though we're a very small country Brazil is one of the biggest beef producers as well, uh, that global scale. Uh, but we export practically the 90% of the beef we produce, the 90% is exported to another market. So we have to be careful that we have a massive production, but it's still we have to look at this um, sustainable production and also that we do the best of the things that we produce in our country, okay? And, but that will be applicable to any country with a large meat industry. It could be Brazil, could be uh, uh, China, could be ourselves or even Germany. So this type of uh, carers uh, not taking care or not paying attention to the meat cup products is something that we see in almost every single country. So there are some current uses for the medical products. So it could be like um, medical, pharmaceutical, or even veterinary uses. So you can use the collagen for cosmetics. We all know this hydrolyzed collagen for your skin to make creams and pomades. There are some molecules that could, you can extract, uh, like heparin or some other ones that have a medical use. But that's a very tiny part of the of the use of these products or this not red meat. Uh, products from from the animals also there are some current culinary uses um i uh, i remember when i was a kid 30 years ago everything was used for making a dish or was cooked and so on but nowadays the, the consumption of uh, heart or liver or kidneys is decreasing a lot so we have a problem that we still produce 
we produce more than those because the meat production is increasing, but they are less consumed. So they are, um, there is like, a, a, let's say, an overproduction of these meat products. But something that we try to, to make the meat processors to understand is that they, they are animal protein providers. So at the, they, they want to provide proteins to the population. They want to feed the population, but in such a way that is a taste and healthy and it's a good experience for the consumer when they are eating the meat or a meat product. So we did some analysis looking for the nutritional value of this of the main products and the most of them the the protein content is equal or higher to a lean meat to a regular steak and the amino acid profile the the amount of essential amino acid profiles is also equal or even higher which means that uh, it means that from a nutritional point of view they are a very promising and a, and a, and a very good source of proteins uh, for our diet so for instance I, when looking to the blood, the 60% of amino acids in blood, they are essential amino acids. While if you look to a steak from the loin or the strip loin, it's like 40, 45%. So we, with this in mind that we're generating a, a lot of these coproducts that they have no extra value or they are, they, there is no market for them. We, we try to create a chain uh, or to create a, um, opportunities for them. So we were looking for further applications and what applications will be the most promising ones. So for, for instance, um, there is a chain of added value for blood proteins, which is the figure on the top. And the, the lowest value you get for fertilizers, that it goes for animal feed, then pet food, human food, and the highest value you can get is you apply these proteins in pharma. So pharma is the one paying the, 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 the more for these raw materials. It's similar to that is if you look to the proteins or collagen coming from lungs, uh, pet food is the lowest value, but then if you go to uh, ingredients with some kind of functional properties or functional foods or pharma, again, these are where the, the added value increases. So what we need is new markets. We need diversification. And in order to get these new products or the new, these new applications, we need research and development. So this is, a, this is what our mindset when we were working in this project. So just for instance, um, an, an example of how if you apply technology, if you apply specific processes to purify proteins, how the, the, the extra added value can be there. So blood meal is just the blood collected from the animal and dried uh, in a cooker or using hot air. So they pay like 1,000 euros per ton. So it's one euro per kilo, more or less. If you apply some extraction of purification processes, could be like uh, membrane filtration, could be enzymatic extraction, could be production of bioactive peptides, it could reach 13 times this value. So as, as you are going for a more specialized product, for a more pure protein or for something with a particular function on application, you can increase the cost of this, uh, of this product. This is a particular example from blood, but similar examples could be done for another, for example, for the heart proteins or even for the stomach uh, components or the tendons that you can extract different types of um, collagen with several applications in, in the pharma and the medicine. So what we try to apply in order to recover these proteins and in order to add, it, add value to the different coproducts was the universal recovery strategy, okay? This universal recovery strategy was described uh, for the first time by Galanakis. This is a Greek researcher. And seven years ago that he said that we need to design a specific or tailored processes for a specific raw materials to obtain the compound that we, we, we desire. But as I mentioned it before, it needs to be feasible for the industry. So economically, it needs to be viable. You need to preserve the properties of your compound of interest. The product of corn needs to be safe. You cannot make a new product which has a risk for the consumer. 
and also it needs to demand the consumers and the industry. So makes no sense to do research, makes no sense to do a development of a product that has no other demand in the market or a product that the industry is not interested to. So in, for, for us to know this, we did a lot of surveys with consumers, a lot of surveys with the different industries to see what they would like to see in the, in the market, what would they like to, 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 to develop as, a, as an industry for us to focus our research. So just for instance, uh, I have this example here um, on how depending on the final purpose or the final goal, you can tailor the process or you can tailor uh, yeah, the process or the extraction of, a, uh, of our, the same raw material. So in this case, uh, what is speaking about uh, lungs from cattle, um, we, des we designed two different processes. One of them was to extract uh, functional properties, uh, sorry, functional proteins that can be used as ingredient in meat formulations uh, or, or snacks or things like that. So what you want is to preserve the gelling ability, the emulsifying ability, or that they can be soluble under certain conditions. On the other way, we design a process to extract and to purify reactive peptides. So we were looking for peptides that they, they have uh, antioxidant activity, they might have an anti-diabetic activity, or even they can be good to decrease the blood pressure after being consumed. So depending on that, we, we, de we decide the steps of, of the process. So there are many available technologies to extract proteins and to process them. But keeping in mind what we mentioned before about the universal, universal strategy, this process needs to be economical via viable so you cannot apply a very fancy process to generate a protein that will have a cheap uh, cheap price in the market or you cannot apply a very costly process for a product that won't have uh, a space in the market so the, the technologies that we this, that we use in that case were like uh, acid and alkaline extraction. I will explain that a little bit more in detail later on. Maybe you are already familiar with that. Uh, we use enzymatic extraction, so how you can use proteolytic enzymes to solubilize your protein and to extract peptides. Uh, and then we combine all these uh, traditional technologies with emerging technologies. So we did analysis with uh, or trials with ultrasounds, we do the analysis with uh, pulse electric fields, um, we applied as well high hydrostatic pressures or a combination of them. The aim of using these emerging technologies is that they enhance the interaction between the solvent or the enzymes with your substrate, so you can have better yields of recovery, you can decrease the amount of water to be used in the process, and also the process of extraction it's much shorter you, so you can save energy to get the same yield or so at the end you will get the a process which is faster and cheaper by applying these emerging technologies so after you have done a preliminary extraction using one of those technologies what you have to do is a purification or to remove the, the components that are not of interest for you. So you have technologies as membrane filtration, uh, it could be ultra filtration, nano filtration. You can use electrodialysis to remove the excess of salt. You can use, use uh, regular dialysis or you can use chromatographic technologies. Um, the first one, membrane technology or dialysis, are quite common technologies and very cheap to run. So you will use them for uh, probably the, the proteins that will be used as ingredient in a food product. While uh, chromatographic techniques are more expensive, uh, you need uh, much more knowledge and more investment in your facilities. So probably you will use these technologies when isolating biotite peptides that they have a very high market value. Uh, so the, the, the revenue or, or the profit will be much higher. Finally, what you have to do with your samples or with your product is to stabilize them. So usually stabilization means that you have to put them in a proper packaging, 
uh, protecting them from the external conditions, let's say light, oxygen, uh, moisture, or do you, you need to do some type of encapsulation just to protect them from the environment, or you or usually you want to remove the sex of moisture. So you reduce the water activity in your product and this product will be more stable. So once again, uh, freeze drying will be the technology to choose for something which has a lot of value because it's a very expensive technology to run while spray drying it's much more uh, convenient because it's cheaper to run but uh, you might have a negative impact on the functionality of your proteins so as we mentioned before for each one of these processes it's going to be a tailored process for a particular raw material aiming for a particular target. So you have to consider all these things when designing your, pro your process uh, in order to be something that it's of the taste of the industry. So there are many different raw materials that you can use. So this is just an example of the ones that we look at. Uh, so it could be like uh, red offal, will be the lung, the tongue, the heart could be exudates. For example, when you are aging your meat, there is a drip loss from the meat and this is a, a liquid rich in proteins that can be recovered as well. Uh, you have tendons, pancreas, blood. Also, even in the processing, when you are cooking your, your hams or you are cooking your, pro your different meat products, there is an exudate, there is a cook loss that we can recover and we can analyze. So we just, the look only to the meat products as red meat as offal as, as it's called or the organs but we also look aside the streams coming from the meat processing operation so what we did after that as i mentioned is to investigate the functionality of this uh, of these different ingredients or these different proteins to understand what the best use for each one of them will be so we we studied mainly emulsifying ability all of them were very good for emulsify emulsification uh, solubility as well we do gelling and then water and oil holding capacity we focus on these um, functional properties because these are the main ones that you will look at when developing a new meat product or a new meat based product it could be burgers sausages or, or things like that or cooked ham or jerky so because of that we focus on that and what we found is that the proteins that we extracted from these co-products behave as good as the proteins that you can get from the red meat so they they, they can be used to replace a red meat in some of the products and still the technical quality of the products and the nutritional quality of the final product will be very similar. Yeah. So the, the final consumer won't notice any, uh, any decrease in the quality and still they will have a good uh, supply of proteins. So then uh, with the same particular processes, and I will explain a couple of them, and some of the applications that, uh, that we found of interest. So as I mentioned before, one of the most common processes to extract proteins is called pH shift or isoelectrical solubilization precipitation. Okay. This process can be used for almost any type of raw material rich in proteins. Um, and it is based on how the proteins respond to different pHs. So as you might know, the, the, the proteins, they are, they, they are not always soluble depending on the pH. So they have a point where it's called the high solectric pH, which is where the solubility is the lowest. So the proteins will precipitate and will be very easy recoverable by filtration or centrifugation. But if you change the pH of your solution and you go away of this isoelectric pH, the proteins become more soluble. So they go into the solution and uh, it's very convenient for this process because what you do, you start with the pH of your meat, which usually is five or six or the internal organ. So all the proteins are not soluble, are, are solid. They, they cannot be extracted. So what we do next is we increase or we decrease the pH to a value around pH 11 or pH 1. And at these values, the proteins are very soluble. 
So at, at that time, you do like a centrifugation step and you remove all the solid parts that you are not interested in, which might be bones, which be some minerals, or, uh, or it can be collagen. Collagen is the only one protein that does not uh, become soluble as you change the pH, okay? But because they have a particular structure that doesn't respond very well to changing pH. So once you have removed the solid part that you are not interested in, what you do then is you change the pH again to the high solectic pH between five and six, and all the proteins will precipitate. You do a second step of filtration or centrifugation, and what you get at the end is a very pure form of your protein in a solid state. And after that, you can dry it or you can uh, keep it uh, frozen to, to stabilize the product. But by means of this process, which is very quick, it's very cheap, you can purify and extract large amount of proteins. This process is uh, scalable very easily. So it can be applicable to one kilogram of raw material up to several tons of this material. So we did apply this, uh, this process uh, to extract proteins from lungs, okay? Lungs is one of the products that is mostly used for pet food or it's discarded uh, straight away. So have no, has no further use in the, in the food industry. So applying the protocol that I explained before about the pH shift, we optimize this process, sorry, we use a statistical tool, which is called response surface methodology. And by means of this statistical tool, uh, you can describe the effect of the main factors affecting a process. In this case, we know that temperature, pH, extraction time, and the amount of water that you add to your sample are the four main factors affecting your extraction. So we, we tried different combinations of pH, temperature, we tried different combinations of time and solvent sample ratio, and we optimized this process. And what we saw is that pH as solvent sample ratio is the main drivers of this process, while temperature and time has no a real effect. So with this, we could design a process which uh, we apply the conditions from the industry. Let's say not temperature is needed, so it's a cheaper process. You don't need to heat up or you don't need to chill down the, the process. And it's a quick time process. So they can do several batches on the same day, which is of benefit for the industry. What we saw is that we could get two different fractions from the lungs. One was a collagen-rich fraction. That, as I mentioned before, it doesn't dissolve uh, no matter what pH you use. And we got a second fraction, which was rich in functional proteins. So by means of this very simple process, we got a collagen that can be used as um, a jellyfying agent, could be used as a casing for sausages or Collagen has many other uses once you hydrolyze them in form of gelatin. And then we got another second product that could be used as a emulsifier or could be used as a foaming agent in food formulations. And the good thing of that is that the final product, it doesn't remind you to an internal organ because it's a powder uh, and it's very easy to incorporate and there's, there, there won't be rejection by the consumer. Um, another that processing, uh, thanks Luciana for the question because now it helps me to explain that. So when you process blood, uh, you have to do a centrifugation to separate the plasma from the red cells, but this separation is not very efficient. Uh, in terms that the red cells can be broken, so they will release the hemoglobin into the plasma and the plasma will be very red, uh, so the application, it's less because the quality will be lower. Uh, the plasma needs to be very white, needs to be free of hemoglobin, otherwise the food industry won't be using that. So we design another particular process uh, to improve the blood separation, and we optimize this process using the same statistical tool that we used before, the response through phase methodology. What we found is that we could optimize the centrifugation speed in the centrifuge. And by adding a specific amount of uh, salt, 
we could separate in a better way the plasma from the red cells. This is a very simple step that we optimize, but by means of that, we obtain uh, the highest quality plasma that you can get. And then the, what we saw as well, that the yield of the process is much better because you have a better separation between the plasma proteins and the red cells. So you recover more proteins into the plasma, uh, which is the highest value at the moment. So it will be of more benefit for the industry. And then the remaining part, the red cells, uh, at the end, it was like a very thick paste, was very condensed paste, which will be easier to dry, will be easier to handle. So it will be uh, some hover benefit for the industry. Uh, um, as I mentioned before, we combine these extraction processes, mainly the pH shift uh, with other technologies. In this case, it was ultrasounds and pulse electric fields. I don't know if you are familiar with these two technologies. Uh, uh, probably yes. Okay. So as, as you know, ultrasound that uh, enhances or increases the speed of reactions. And also because it has a cavitation effect, it uh, destroys the matrix. So it helps to the extraction buffer or the enzymes to interact with the matrix. And it helps to have a better yield of extraction in shorter times. Pulse electric fields works in a different way. So you apply very, very short pulses of electricity to your sample at very high intensity, and it promotes cell electroporation, which means that you create pores in the cell membranes, facilitating the extraction of the material contained in the cells of the sample. So we apply this too, just to check uh, how did it work. And what we saw is that when you apply this technology to the lungs, we obtain a pure form, a more pure form of collagen and a pure, more pure form of the functional proper, proteins that I explained before. But we, when we try to extract some enzymes from the pancreas, which is called pancreatin, which has a lot of applications in medicine, the gel increases a lot, but the activity was killed. So that's what I mentioned before that some technology could be very promising. You will have better gels, but you are not keeping the properties or the functionality of your of your targeting compound. So in this case, the ultrasound worked very well for the um, uh, lung processing, but not for the pancreas processing. On the other side, the pulse electric fields, we didn't see a better extraction yield for this particular case, although we know that it's... Uh, it's of benefit for another processes. So as I mentioned before, you have to design a particular process for each one of the products that you are working with. Uh, something that we did as well is to generate bioactive peptides. As you know, peptides are short fragments of proteins that once consumed, they can have a, an impact on your body fun uh, function or in your health. So we use all the different proteins in the different meat co-products from the tendons, the blood, the lungs, all of them. We identify all the proteins present in them. And by using in silico tools, we did in the computer an, um, an artificial combination of enzymes and proteins. In silico tool means that uh, you have a database with your proteins you put the enzyme or the proteolytic enzyme that you want to use, and the software predicts the sequences that you will get after this. Then using the same in silico tools, the sequences are screened on a database, and the software will predict if there is a potential peptide with antioxidant activity, if this peptide has some allergenicity, or if it has some potential to be toxic. So you do that because you save a lot of time and money because you do everything with the computer. Once you have selected the right combination between protein and enzyme, you check on an in vitro analysis that the peptide that you, uh, that you predicted to obtain actually is in there. So this is more or less the approach that we follow in that case. So what we, after doing this analysis in silico and then in vitro, we were able to isolate uh, fractions from blood that they were incorporated into bread 
and they were proved to have antihypertensive effect on rats and also an anti-diabetic effect. Uh, also, we saw that some other pr proteins from the lung extraction, mostly coming from the collagen, they had an immunomodulatory potential and also they could use the DNA damage provide, uh, I mean, provoked for, for the oxidation or for the oxidative stress. As you can imagine, uh, obtaining the proteins from lung using PHC is very cheap. It's not complicated and you don't require a lot of investment in equipment. However, to produce these PF type peptides is a more complicated process. You need to control very strictly the pH, the temperature, the ratio between protein and enzyme. And then there is a whole process of purification that will involve uh, ultrafiltration, chromatographic techniques, and some stabilization using probably freeze drying or even encapsulation to protect the, the biaptide peptides once in a food. So this process is much more expensive. Um, you need to prove that your peptides, they have an uh, application and they have some activity of interest for the consumer and for the industry. Uh, we look at as well, but not really in detail, about uh, naturally occurring bioactive peptides. So the, the ones that we produced in the previous step, they were artificially produced by enzymes, while these are already present in the meat. Um, we are looking mainly to carnitine, carnosine, creatine, creatinine, and taurine, because we know that they have good in, with effects on your performance and your muscle activity. Uh, but what we found is that the most of them, they were lower in their meat coproducts than in meat. So it makes no sense to use them for this. The only one that was higher was taurine, but chemical synthesis is much cheaper and easier than extraction from the meat coproducts. So that was not an avenue that we will follow because there was not economically viable and was very challenging when there is when there was um, an easier solution already there. Uh, what we did afterwards was to scale up of the selected processes. So in order to prove to the industry that the processes that you develop at lab scale are feasible and are suitable for their needs, you need to validate this process using large volumes. So we selected the enzymatic hydrolysis of blood to generate antioxidant peptides and the extraction of collagen and proteins from lung. And we did that uh, in 100 liters uh, vessels. And we validated that the yield and the production was practically the same that what we saw in the lab. It means that these processes are very scalable. So you are not seeing any different in the final product regardless the volume or the size of your production. So just mention a few applications and I'm almost done. <laughs> um, we extracted collagen for several sources, mainly the trachea from the animals, the bronchio, the tendons, uh, and the cartilage covering the, the tip of the bones. This is a very laborious process because it takes a lot of labor to extract them. But, uh, and that in, implies a lot of cost for the producer. But these materials are mainly used for medical applications, uh, biomedicine. So they can be used for uh, as an scaffold, as a platform to cell regeneration and cell growth to be used in transplants or to be used to cell growth or cell, cell proliferation. Uh, and we saw that the collagens that we were extracted and purified, they perform as well as the current methods that are used in, in, the, in the hospitals or in the biomedical uh, institutions. Other thing that we do is that from the red cells, we design a new process to create bioplastics. Uh, and the good thing is that these bioplastics, they are fully edible, they are biodegradable, uh, and they can be used for several food applications as, as a packaging. But we also saw that we can incorporate uh, antimicrobial uh, agents into the film and they will be a very good barrier to preserve the products. And finally, we saw that these biomaterials, they perform very well as a platform to cell growth. Uh, 
So there is a potential to use these bioplastics to replace more expensive synthetic uh, scaffolds for cell growth by using this type of technology. And that's the take home messages, so I'm nearly done. So that coproducts were seen at then as a source of high value proteins, bioactive peptides, and also building blocks for novel materials. As I make emphasis, uh, we have to do tailor extraction processes for the specific coproducts. Not every single process or every single technology will be applied for every single raw material. And then when you have a process that you think is promising and can be applicable, you always have to do an economical analysis and be sure that the industry and the consumer is something that they will be demand in the future. So that's everything from my side uh, about this topic. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. Uh, it was a, an incredible overview of uh, what technologies are being studied and applied to industry. That is very, very exciting. Uh, I, I was very impressed about uh, uh, pulse uh, electric, electric, or uh, pulse electric. Uh, I think I forgot the last word, but. Uh, uh, it's a technique that using biotechnology. I I was not aware that they were still using that industrial scale. That that's very uh, okay. It's electric field. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the moment, we're using this at, at lab scale. So our system allows us to use two liters volume, no more than that. But there are industrial applications, for example, in the potato industry. They apply these pulse electric fields to the potatoes, and then the peeling is much easier. And when they go for deep frying or they go for further processing, it's faster. So uh, that's one of the applications. We apply pulse electric fields as well for recovering proteins from plant-based materials because we saw that uh, the pulse electric fields can degrade the cell wall of the plant cells, which is a very resistant material. But by means of this, you can degrade that material and facilitates the extraction of polyphenols or some other compounds that ha can have an application in the food industry. All right, thank you, it's great. Then uh, please, Raise your hands and we start the question with the students. Um, um, Luciana, you can start uh, waiting for the other students to raise your hands too. Luciana, it's your word. Okay, so I'll try to explain my, my thought. I'm still thinking about what you said earlier about feeding uh, the insects with blood. Mm -hmm. So I'm still processing that. So. I mean, the main idea of using insects in, in the food of humans is to, to have an alternative protein, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the future, we will have, like, we have to decrease the use of meat, of like red meat and all. So I was wondering to, to what extent it makes sense to use blood, which is a co-product of like cows and animals as a source of food for insects. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Very good question. And I would be very happy if I wouldn't have to use blood to feed the insects. I would be very happy if we don't have to use that because that means that the blood is literally used for another applications. So. There are very few products in the market where blood is used as an ingredient. So it means that all this protein, very high value protein, is used for something else, which is not food. So you are losing these proteins. And we know that meat production, even though we are said that we need to decrease, that we have to be more conservative, it will increase. 
it's going to be increased because there are higher demand of red meat proteins. The many countries are becoming more wealthy, so they want to eat meat, and this production will increase. Therefore, blood production will increase. But there is no application for that. So what we're trying to do, okay, you don't want to eat blood directly. We will use insects to transform these proteins in something that you might accept, maybe. That, that's the logic behind that. But as I said, if I'm able to find, an, or not me, or somebody else is able to find an application for blood, mainly the red fraction, for another application, I will be very happy because the insects, they can be fed with many other things as well. So. Okay, because I when I was, I I know that like food, uh, red meat uh, consumption will increase because countries, like poor mm. countries in Africa or maybe in South America, they will, as we get richer, we tend to consume meat. However, I see that like in a near future, like to maybe 2050. However, in a longer future, mm. I don't. And maybe that's only my opinion. I don't think that in a year, in a longer future, we will use as much as red meat as we are using today. But that's just no, I, my opinion. I agree with you. Um, when you look to the meat consumption in countries um, that they were considered rich a few years ago, so the meat consumption increased at the beginning when they are becoming richer, but then decrease. So it's like, okay, we, we know that we know meat, we can meet, get meat whenever we want. So we don't have this rush to eat that much meat. And now we're looking for another alternatives. We're looking for another type of diet. So you will have more flexitarians. You will have more vegetarian people. And probably this will happen with emerging countries that now the meat consumption is increasing. But in a few years, as you said, probably will decrease again. So, Yeah. If this happens, we don't have to worry about red cells anymore because there will not be an excess. There will not be. But in our current scenario, it's a big problem. And the current legislation in Europe forced you to collect all the blood and to use all the blood. for uh, Not just for fertilizer or land filling. You have to use for some high added value applications. And that could be one of the solutions won't be the only one maybe it's not the best but it's one of the one we're exploring uh, as i said before insects will grow with any other protein source so you can use any other thing to feed them but because we have this current problem with blood we thought that would be relevant to see uh, how the insects will behave with blood but yeah ideally uh, that that shouldn't be there <laughs> okay thank you you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, now, Celie, Celie, your question, please. Oh, she's mute. Your microphone, Celie, seu microfone, por favor, está fechado. Buenas tardes, professor. Eu prefiro falar em espanhol. Tinta. Tinta. Como, como... Pode os organismos governamentais promover o consumo desses produtos? Ah, eu não entendi, sorry. Quando você Como fala que tem barulho. Pode os organismos governamentais promover o desenvolvimento do oh, okay, okay. consumo dos produtos? Ok, então. So... Uh, what we're doing, you mean for the insects or for all of them? If if it's for the insects, what we're trying to do is to to educate the people, to educate the consumers about the benefits of the insects. So we did some surveys and where we just offering insects or other products to consumers with no more explanation. And the most of them, they will choose the traditional product. But then the same consumers, a few days later, we explain this is the same product and this is the insect that will have these benefits for the environment, this has these benefits for the sustainability and have these benefits from your health or is, is they are equally good for your 
nutrition point of view. And there was a big portion of them that they say, okay, if now that I understand why I might need to consume insects, I'm willing to do so because I see the benefits at the global scale. When we did the same exercise for the meat products, we had a similar experience. So once you explain that the, the protein profile, the nutritional quality is very similar, and we demonstrate that we can incorporate these proteins into several products with no impact on the flavor or the eating experience, they, will, they didn't mind to have these new formulations in the market. So it's a matter of education and communication. It's, it's the main thing that we have to do. Gracias. De nada. Obrigado. Uh, thank you. And um, Sibeli has raised his, her hand. Sibeli, you, your, your question, please. Buenas tardes. Creen que en el futuro las personas que usan proteína de suero podrían adherirse a la suplementación a través de insectos? Can you repeat? It was a little bit of echo, uh, echo there, so, yeah. Supermetasone a través de insectos. Sibeli, so, está, está muito difícil de entender, porque está cortando um pouquinho. Talvez fazer em português e eu tento te ajudar. Sibeli, está aí? Ok, she's chat is writing in the chat. Ok. Ok. I don't know the answer, to be honest. She's asking if uh, in the future people who make use of whey protein might be attracted to an, uh, to insects consumption. I don't know the answer. I don't know. Uh, but what I know for the dairy industry, it was a long way for them to convince people that whey, which was a byproduct or a co-product, is also a good source of proteins. And now some of the cheese factories, they do more money selling the protein waste than the cheese. So I, I always try to understand how they did that to apply the same, let's say the same chain of events to the meat products, but I, I was not able to do so. Uh, but, um, and I believe it doesn't correlate if you are eating whey or you're eating another type of proteins that you will be willing to eat insects. Um, at least not in Europe, that's, that's the, the consumers I know, because they are very, very familiar with whey proteins. Uh, maybe the people now in sports or that they want to care about their diet and increase protein content, they have been seeing whey protein, protein products in the market for many years, so it's very common to them. Maybe in 10, 15 years, if we are placing insect products in the market, then during the younger generations will see them as a normal protein source and they will be willing to, to use them. But uh, I don't know, to be honest. Right, thank you. Thank you for answering. Um, next question is from Agnes. Agnes, you can do your question. Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, gracias por su, su tiempo y su presentación. Yo prefiero hablar en portuñol. No sé si <risa> puede me entender, pero vamos, yo voy a hacer un comentario, una pregunta. Uh, muchos surveys, existen muchos surveys con consumidores potenciales en todo el mundo y la neofobia es uno de los principales factores para rechazar nuevos alimentos con insectos. Lo mismo puede pasar con los coproductos cárnicos. Um, ¿Cómo podemos convencer a las personas que coman estos productos? En, pero también uh, existen mucho, muchos lugares aquí en Brasil, en Bahía, que tienen uh, alimentos regionales que utilizan subproductos de la carne, como el chinchín de bofe, que utiliza mm -hmm. el limón de bovido, bovido uh, feijoada, sarapateo, buchada de bode. Um, ¿Conoces otros platos alrededor del mundo? <risa> y estos lugares que ya tienen la, lo, la costumbre de comer insectos y coproductos serían la primera estrategia para 
para que eh, coloquen estos nuevos productos en, en el mercado? Uh -huh. Cierto es. Um... Well, you don't need to convince people that already eat meat co-products to eat meat co-products. So, and we, we saw like a different trend uh, when you compare meat co-products and insects. Older generations, they are very happy to eat liver or tongue or heart because this is something that they, they were eating when they were kids or young. But they, they are not going to eat insects because that's something new for them and that's the neophobia thing. However, for the insects, it's something different. The young generations, when we did the studies and surveys, they don't like to eat these meat co products. They think they are not tasty or they are not healthy or they have several reasons for not eating those. But they wouldn't mind to try insects because it's something new, it's something that for adventurous people that they would like to try something exotic. So there is a different trend between the two co products. But as I mentioned to Thali, education and uh, information is the key thing to do. So we do a lot of uh, effort on webinars, on workshops, or just writing newspaper letters just to describe what we do and why do we believe that insects or milk products are good sources of, of proteins. But still, um, that's the way that we believe is the best way to reach the people. Uh, but it's still meat for some people is considered like um, not necessary for ethical reasons or for something like that. And for the insects, for instance, we don't know at the moment if uh, vegetarian people will eat insects. Technically, they are animals. So I've spoken with some vegetarian people, some of them, yeah, that this is not an animal that can suffer. I wouldn't mind to eat insects. Others say that no, they will suffer or they have um, their sent animales sentientes or sentient animals. So it's still the same ethical problem to me. And in front of that, you have no arguments to to discuss with them because it's an ethical problem, it's a moral problem. You not you cannot convince people to do other things, but the people that are in hesitation or they they are willing to prove or to to test try new things, yeah, that's where we can make an, an effort on communicating and and translate our research into something they can understand. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. All right, thank you, thank you. Then uh, I will. Let the, another person to have a question. Andrea, it's your question, please. Andrea, I, 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 we cannot see you. Andrea, okay. Buenas tardes. Gracias por la presentación. Eh, es un, una cuestión. ¿Crees que la harina de insectos es una realidad y utilizada para transformar? la calidad de las carnes o aún está solo en el campo teórico y otra duda es habría algún riesgo en la, el uso de insectos por ejemplo alguna posibilidad de aumentar su producción convertiéndolos en plagas two very good questions the first one uh, there are many many trials and many research going on trying to replace meat products with insect proteins and meat proteins, they are much better in terms of functionality. So when you are looking at emulsion capacity or um, gelling capacity, meat proteins are s slightly better or much better depending on the conditions of pH and salt and so on. So it's very hard to fully replace them. Okay. Uh, what we saw is that if you replace 10, 20% of the meat proteins with a um, insect powder or an insect flower, it can be done. It's technically possible. So that's the way. Not a fully replacement, but a partial replacement. If you want to do a full replacement, you have to use another ingredients. It could be lecithin, it could be um, some artificial emulsifiers. So 
A meat burger, for, for instance, is a very natural product with very few ingredients. If you want to mimic or to replicate that by using insect proteins, the list of ingredients will be much larger. So th there is um, different ways of doing that, but still you need some starch, you need some other ingredients to, to emulate the texture and, and the properties. And the second question, the reason why some of the insects are not allowed or are not approved is because they can be a plague or they can be a problem if they are released into the environment. So the ones that are approved at the moment is because they already exist in the in the in the space that, where they are read in the in the wild. So if they are released, it's not a problem. It's something that already exists. Or if it doesn't exist, they won't survive with the external environmental conditions maybe because the winter is so cold or there are not the right conditions for them to produce the eggs or to whatever, something, some biological reason or, or ecological reason, they won't uh, grow on that uh, if they release. But so this is one of the barriers for, for them to be used. Right, thank you. Um, Kelly has a question. She shared the question in another channel with me. I'll, I'll translate okay. it here. Okay. Um, she was telling that uh, she wanted to know if uh, that uh, uh, insect will be, will, will, you've told about uh, uh, put some uh, part of the food uh, replaced with insects. And she wants to know if uh, maybe in the future you believe that uh, it will be a full uh, food for a human um, based that uh, uh, in France there is a very big farm of insects and uh, I think England has announced that uh, he will grow uh, much bigger or a rat has a much bigger farm. Could you, could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, one of the things that we are looking at is that the most of the insect production is done manually. So you have a technician or you have somebody doing the actual work. So feeding the animals, cleaning the craze, uh, everything is done by hand. So in order to make this uh, more uh, profitable, you have to uh, automatize every single process or every single step of the process. I'm not familiar with what they were doing in France, but I know that this new facility probably will be using a lot of robotics, a lot of automotion. So everything will be done or controlled by intelligence, artificial intelligence. They will have everything controlled by maybe less operators. Everything will be done automatically. So that will reduce the production cost, which is one of the main things at the moment. One kilogram of insects, dry insect, maybe 30, 40 euros here in, in Ireland, which is very expensive. You cannot compete with other protein sources. So one of the ways of reducing the cost is that one to have very large facilities, very well controlled in terms of uh, environmental conditions, in terms of uh, how to treat the, the substrate, how to automatize the whole, the whole system. So that's the the future of the production as we see it. Uh, and I know that most of the producers or the processors in Europe, they have farms in Asia. So they are importing all the insects here and then they make the processing in here because the, I mean, the, the, the labor is cheaper there, but they want now to move the factories in here using high tech factories to make cheaper, to make a cheaper process. Right, thank you. Um, Juliana uh, has a question. Juliana, uh, she's writing. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. I can see. So she's asking if uh, when using insects uh, to replace meat products, if the amino acid composition will be different, will be different. So yeah, probably will be different. Uh, the amino acid profile of meat, it's slightly better than the exit. So some of the essential amino acids, uh, they are in higher quantity in meat rather than in insects. So that, that's this difference. So once again, 
if you make a full product just with insects, probably the amino acid profile won't be the best, but it will be similar. If you use like 10, 20 per third replacement, the impact in the nutritional quality won't be that high. So that's why the most of the research is going in that direction to replace um, small proportions of the meat by insect meat. So you keep the technological function, you keep the nutritional properties, but it's still you are adding a more sustainable protein source to your product. Right, thank you. I think we have one last question from Beatrice. Beatrice, do you want to, to try to write or will you speak your question? Okay. Okay, so about the first part presented, insects are already used for animal feed. Can the use of insects for human food generate food competitiveness between species? Uh, this is something we're looking at as well. Uh, so because of that, we're using to feed the insect products or materials that are not suitable for food consumption anymore or for human consumption anymore. Uh, red cells is one of the examples because no one is eating that, so we can use this. But also we use uh, catering waste that is not suitable for human food anymore or we're using leftovers from crop production or harvesting that they're very rich in fiber, which is not digestible. So they have not a current application in the food industry. So we want to avoid, or what it's desirable is to avoid competition between food for humans and food for insects. And because insects are so flexible in terms of diet, that's not a complicated thing to do. You, you can feed them with many different things. So that, that can be done easily with not competing with human food. Okay, thank you, uh, Beatrice, you raise your question. Uh, okay, Beatrice has another okay. question. <laughs> question. Okay. Okay, so she's asking about the um, a resolution in Brazil that deals with foreign matter in food and beverage and their tolerance limit, and that includes insects. Uh, she knows that uh, we are not talking about the same insect that will be used for consumption, but I would like to know if the integration of insects in the food industry Okay, I think uh... It's frozen. I think it's just Carlos. Uh, yes. Carlos. Ele caiu. Eu acho que sim, acho que ele caiu. Vamos aguardar um pouquinho e daí a gente aguarda aí para a gente encerrar. Eu acho que se alguém tem mais alguma pergunta é agora, né? Uh, are you back, Carlos? We we cannot listen to you. We we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Hello. Yes, you are back. I, I lost. Can <laughs> I think? Okay. That means that I have to leave in five minutes. They're kicking me out of the office. <laughs> yes, that's right. We, are, we have to finish as well. We are just okay. trying to finish. That's the last question. Okay, so yes, regarding this um, uh, sanitary control, I don't think it will be a problem because the insect reading facilities, they will be monitored. They will have their own legislation and regulation how to breed the insects to be safe and not hazardous for the human food. And probably we can develop uh, particular techniques to identify what the species of insects are present or not. I mean, th there is a lot of research now on fraud in meat, so you can develop molecular technologies, you can develop many different tools to ensure that what is in the label is actually what you are eating, and there is no any controversy on that. Mm. 
Thank you. I think it's fine. Uh, Carlos, uh, we'd like to thank you in the name of the coordinator, Professor Ederla Ferreira, uh, for your participation and for your time for sharing all that information and for your time to prepare all this material and this time to talk with us. It was a great pleasure. Uh, agradecemos muchísimo, Carlos, que fue un gran placer. Así que que pensamos que se, se puede tener nuevamente en otro momento, en otra oportunidad para que pueda hablar con nosotros. Así que fue un gran placer. Así que si tenga alguna última palabra, la palabra es tuya para entonces encerrar. No, no, solo muchas gracias por, por la invitación. Ha sido muy interesante tener estas discusiones y estas conversaciones. Y sí, si creéis que puedo servir o aportar algo más en el futuro, bueno, ya sabes cómo puedes contactarme y yo encantado. Así que no hay ningún problema. Muchas gracias a todos y que paséis buena tarde. Okay, thank you. We finish your presentation here. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everybody. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.